Suddenly, my parents appeared and started knocking on the car window. Dad, did someone ask you for something? Well, what could that be? You're always so stubborn. Just go and convince your husband James. Say the chairman should be William because it's better for the company and step down. Or else. So, they've teamed up with my in-laws. To knock James off the chairman's seat. And then I noticed, in mom's hand was something like a crowbar. She swung at high end crash, the window shattered. I was stunned for a while when I heard that a suicide note was found in James's car, who had fallen off a cliff. Then, a week after the car was found, an envelope arrived with a specific delivery date. James? I hurriedly received the envelope and opened it with trembling hands. Inside was a letter. And a key. Read this without our parents finding out. Of course, I knew that. But he probably wanted to write it that way. This is something I wrote in advance, in case something happened. If I'm there when you receive it, just laugh and give it back to me. But if I'm not there, please, Linda, take what's stored in this locker and flee to your Uncle Richard's place immediately. Susan, my sister-in-law who was reading it with me, and I exchanged glances. And then we immediately grabbed the essentials and ran to Richard's house, my husband's uncle. To protect ourselves and our children, and to let both our parents know what they had done. My name is Linda, 34 years old. I'd like to say I'm just an ordinary housewife, but that was only true until a week ago. Now, I'm a widow with two children. James took his own life. That's the most likely possibility, I was told. His car had fallen off a cliff. And a suicide note was found in the dashboard. I can't believe it, I won't believe it. Because it's true. There's no reason for James to take his own life. By himself. Rather. James and I met at our workplace. A real estate resort hotel, the place I had always wanted to work. As a child, I was captivated by a large, beautiful hotel I visited at the invitation of my parents' acquaintance. I chose a university that would teach me important things for the tourism industry, and even my part-time jobs during my student years were behind the scenes at nearby hotels. And finally, I got a job at the resort hotel I had always dreamed of. It was a place known for its strict employee training, and I almost gave up early on. The reason I was able to keep going was thanks to a colleague at that time. People quit one after another, unable to withstand it, but someone was watching over me, the one who remained. That person was James, who later became my husband. We dated for two years before getting married. But I was surprised by a fact I learned at that time. James was the nephew of the chairman of this real estate group. He was supposed to become a part of the group's upper echelon eventually, but at that time, he was still working as a resort hotel employee. After our marriage, James moved from the hotel to the real estate side and started showing his face at his uncle's, the chairman's, office. Originally, this group was just a local real estate business, but it grew significantly after the war. The current chairman is the second since the group was formed, and it's said that Richard's skills played a major role in its growth. During the good times, he convinced his parents, so they suffered less when the economy turned bad. Then they started developing resorts, and that too was steadily advanced. But things started getting fishy around Richard when he fell ill last year. And that was because Richard had no direct heir. That's when Richard appointed James as his successor. And that decision shortened James's life. I couldn't quite come to terms with the news from the police that James had died. In the midst of that, my in-laws kept calling. Linda. What happened to James was something terrible. Something terrible? Is that how these people summarize their own son's situation? Hey, Linda, it's going to be tough on your own, right? Come and live at our house. That's right. With James gone, you're going to have financial difficulties, right? William and Jessica, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, took turns speaking such words to me. Feeling irritated, I responded. I can't think about the future right now. And with that, I hung up the phone. What now? I thought. 
After all, I had only met these in-laws twice. First time, to announce our marriage and the second time was our wedding day. They never even showed their faces when our son and daughter were born. Yes, James had always avoided his parents, my in-laws. He had harbored distrust towards them since our marriage, saying to me, Those people are scum who never even try to work for themselves. James's parents currently hold certain posts within the Smith Real Estate Group. But that's just to keep them from doing anything. James had explained to me. He said they were completely different from the capable Richard, and everything they did turned out to be a detriment to the group. So they're given nominal positions just to keep them from messing up. Just going on inspections, which are basically just vacations, he said. Didn't they take you on those trips, letting you see various places? James scoffed at the thought. Me and Susan were always left behind in our big house. James had a sister named Susan. Susan married a man with no connections to the group and lived in the city where he worked. Robert, Susan's husband and James's brother-in-law, got along strangely well with James. He would go out of his way to visit James when he was nearby for work. Susan would be like, I'm jealous of James. Seeing how close they were. Yes, the two siblings got along well and both had a strained relationship with their parents. But I'm fine with it. Once I got married and moved away, I didn't care about them anymore. Susan said nonchalantly. But James is involved with the group. And that means? Our parents know they're the failures of the group, so they hate seeing James do well. Is that how it is? At our house, yes. But your parents are different, right? Not at all. Yes. My relationship with my parents was not good either. No, it was fine when I was a child. As their only daughter, I thought they loved me. But their true nature emerged when I was in college. Quit college and come back home. That was the sudden message I received. It was for a marriage proposal. They wanted to make me, a 20-year-old at the most, come back home for that reason. Apparently, Thomas, the son of a well-known local figure, had taken a liking to me when he returned home. I insist on having her as my wife. To fulfill Thomas's spoiled wish, my parents were willing to do it for their own benefit. We've raised you so far, so you should show filial piety towards us, right? I felt my image of my parents shatter. They had raised me, their daughter, just for the sake of a return. Realizing this, I firmly refused to return home. Then, they stopped sending me money for education and living expenses. They thought that would make me come back. But I stubbornly refused to return. I consulted with my professor and found a way to continue my studies without being taken back by my parents. It was a struggle until I graduated. I managed to cover my educational expenses through scholarships. The problem was living expenses. I moved out of my secure one-room apartment, sold unused furniture, and moved into an older apartment. My life revolved around university, part-time jobs, and job hunting. I only went back to my room to sleep. As a result, this part-time job experience led to employment and meeting James. And my parents were oddly happy about my marriage to James. Aren't they good parents? Comparing them to his own, James said with a wry smile. No. They did their research. They found out that you are the nephew of the chairman of the real estate group. You're kidding. James couldn't believe it for a while. But when my parents visited for the births of our son Daniel and our daughter Mary, James also realized they were not so different from his own parents. After all, my parents said, Now that you have two kids, your future is secure. Yes, it'll make our lives easier too. James's smile twisted slightly at that moment. Both James and I were sensitive to the words of parents. Especially James, who knew about my struggles during college. Were they a bit too relaxed, or did they just take it for granted? Either way, their words were clearly meant to mooch off of us and our kids in the future. After that, James started to be wary of them too. Distant in-laws, parents trying too hard to make contact. 
While being cautious of both, I continued raising our children. Fortunately, with James' current position and salary, we could afford a housekeeper and a sitter. We don't have trustworthy relatives, but we've managed on our own. But last year, things changed. Richard fell ill. Richard, in his 60s, who always kept fit and seemed immune to sickness, suddenly faced a health crisis. He was in good shape, with no blood pressure issues that I knew of. But an impact he suffered on his head when he was young had now formed a hematoma, pressing on his brain. Emergency surgery saved him, and he was on a good path to recovery with no lasting effects. However, this incident shook the group as Richard hadn't named a successor. Richard himself thought, I can still keep going. That's probably why he hadn't decided yet. But illness strikes unexpectedly. Once you know that, you have to think about a successor. And here's where the problem arose, the choice of who it would be. Richard and his wife had no children. No biological or adopted child was there at that time. So, Richard, while recuperating, nominated James. It seemed a reasonable choice within the group. Most senior employees knew that James was being trained and educated within the group. But some just couldn't accept it. The in-laws. Wait a minute, Richard. Isn't he still too young? Aren't I the closest one to you, Richard? Why are you overlooking William for James? They apparently confronted Richard while he was recuperating. Richard retorted sharply. If I leave it to William and the others, the group will be ruined. And he explained clearly why he chose James. But then, their focus shifted to James. Step down, say you're too young and want your parents to take over. Those were their words. It was a threat, clear and simple. Initially, it was, please. But gradually it turned into, do something about it, or else. Their tone changed. This is bad. What do you mean? They might harm me, you, and our kids if we let them be. Really? I initially wondered if they would go that far. They would. James said. I never thought of them as my parents. And they probably don't think of us siblings as their children, no, that's not right. They only see children as tools to generate profit. I feel the same about my side. No. James shook his head. Their level of scum is worse. Your parents are just hanging on for profit, but mine, they'll try to take everything. Then what should we do? His use of the word take startled me. We had finally found a family filled with love and trust. I didn't want anyone to be hurt. I have an idea. I'll make sure the condo's security is tight against intruders. So Linda, please protect the kids when you're outside of the house. I'm not sure if I can handle it alone. I'll ask a security company through Richard. They'll discreetly guard you when you're out. Understood. I responded. Since then, I've chosen popular places for outings with the kids. I also actively participated in gatherings with mom friends. It's harder for them to harm us when we're in a group. But still, there was a time when someone tried to kidnap one of the kids. It first happened at the park while playing with the other kids. I thought I would just be chatting with mom friends while we watched our kids play. But then, a plump middle-aged woman, who seemed to be just strolling, suddenly picked up Mary and started running. Luckily, the security guard, who was watching over us discreetly, quickly intervened. But the woman who tried to kidnap Mary ran away with surprising agility. In the end, we never found out why or who was behind it. People, be careful, it's a scary world out there. Everyone would just say. We agreed on a common understanding to be wary of both money motives and pranks. But I had forgotten one thing to be wary of. Hey there. I ran into my parents in the condo's parking lot. It was right after shopping with the kids, as we were getting out of the car. I quickly turned back into the car and locked it. Blatantly, my parents started banging on the car windows. Mom, why are Grandpa and Grandma doing this? I'm scared. I cracked the window just enough to speak through it. 
I really didn't want to open it, but we couldn't talk with it closed. What do you want? Ah, you finally opened it. Listen, Linda, could you please talk to James? What? You know, isn't it a bit off that young James is becoming the next chairman? Shouldn't it be William's turn? A chill ran down my spine. Could it be that these people? Dad, did someone ask you to do this? What? I don't know what you're talking about. Dad pretended not to know what I was talking about. And Mom said, You're always so stubborn. Just go and convince your husband James. Say the chairman should be William because it's better for the company and step down. Or else. In Mom's hand was something like a crowbar. Then she swung at high-end crash, the window shattered. The kids screamed. Mom reached her hand through the broken window. Get down! I yelled to the kids and frantically honked the horn, signaling to the security guard who must have been nearby. Thankfully, several men soon came running. Tisk! My parents clicked their tongues and quickly left the scene, escaping in a nearby car. Are you okay? The security guards asked us. I'm fine, but the kids... I'm okay! Daniel responded loudly. But it was true that shards of glass had fallen on both of them. I'll head back to our room now. Can you escort us to the entrance, please? The guards agreed and escorted us. The manager was surprised at our situation and promised to thoroughly guard against outsiders. That night, I told James everything. My own parents, of all people. Ah, they must have been convinced. Offering a good position if they become chairman or something. It was likely. Very likely. Why did both our parents have to be such people? This is seriously bad. I'll go to Richard and ask him to look after you and the kids for a while. To Richard? Yes, but we have to make sure we're not noticed. Also, I'll contact Susan. I want her to stay with you and the kids for a bit. But won't that be a burden on Susan? Considering who we're dealing with, it's necessary. They might think the same thing could happen to Susan since she's of the same bloodline. We're better off making a united front. With that, James immediately contacted Susan. Unbelievable! Those people! All right, James, I'll join you. What about Robert? Robert's got work, right? Well yeah, but, okay, I'll talk to him. Thanks. It's good to have siblings at times like this. I thought to myself. And the next day, Susan came over promptly. I told Robert about the situation, and he said he's got something to look into and will join us later. Really? Robert's reliable. Well, he is the man I chose. We laughed together. But the day after that conversation, the call from the police came. We've found James Smith's car at the bottom of a cliff. I couldn't grasp the meaning of the words immediately. What does that mean? He was brought into the hospital earlier. I couldn't quite process the rest of the words. Mrs. Smith, are you listening? I heard the voice from the other end, but I couldn't move right away. Shocked, Susan took over the call. After that, it felt like I was just being dragged around by Susan everywhere. We went to the police, confirmed things, and were handed an envelope found on the dashboard. A will. When opened, there was a printed letter inside. The content was, I can't bear the burden of being nominated as chairman, I'm sorry. That's what it said. So, has the police concluded that James took his own life? No, there's still an autopsy and other procedures, so the final conclusion will come later. We're just showing you this because it was found. There's no way he'd do this to himself! I was shouting loudly. James, who always told us to be careful. I couldn't find any more words after that. The police said, We'll contact you when it's time to return James's body. And sent us home. I can't clearly remember what happened for a while after that. The local news on TV was saying, 
it's not yet clear whether it was an accident. Having said that, they also said, a suicide note was found, and there's a strong belief that he took his own life. That was how it was reported on the news. I was so angry, I turned off the TV, and the kids looked at me anxiously. Is daddy coming back? Daniel is eight, Mary just five. Both of them had been taken out of school and kindergarten for a while. I was truly grateful Susan was there. My mind felt like it was covered with a thin film at that time, everything felt unreal. However, a week after the car was found, an envelope arrived with a specific delivery date. Linda, take a look at this. Susan handed it to me, who was in a daze. I glanced at the sender's name and my eyes widened. James? In a rush, I took the envelope and opened it with trembling hands. Inside was a letter. And a key. Read this without our parents finding out. Of course, I knew that. But he probably wanted to write it that way. This is something I wrote in advance in case something happened. If I'm there when you receive it, just give it back to me. But if I'm not, please Linda, take what's stored in this locker and run to Richard's place immediately. Susan and I, reading it together, looked at each other. Then hurriedly, taking only the bare minimum, we took the kids and all got into Susan's car. My car had been under repair since that time. I didn't feel confident driving a rental car to Richard's in the next state. So, I relied on Susan. Leave it to me, just wear a hat and a mask. Susan said with a smile. And then we drove non-stop. We were anxious until we reached Richard's house in the next state. I assumed security guards were nearby. But after what happened to James, I was worried something might happen to the car. While on the road, I contacted Richard's house. We're on our way. We parked inside the property and hurried towards the main house. Richard and his wife Nancy were already there to greet us. We're glad you're here, Linda, Susan. James asked us to guard you guys, and said he'd send you guys here eventually. But to think it would come to this. Thank you for having us. I'm sorry. This was the only place we could turn to. I apologized deeply. The kids were looking around the grand entrance in amazement. Don't worry. I didn't expect it to come to this. I underestimated them. I never thought they'd actually target James himself, those bastards. Richard clenched his fist in frustration. We were led into a large, cozy living room. The room had a calm and warm atmosphere. Nancy instructed the housekeeper, then brought the kids to a corner of the room with some snacks. Thank you so much. It's all right. You want to keep the kids in sight right now, don't you? Yes, I didn't want to take my eyes off of them even for a moment. But the conversation we were about to have was not something I wanted the children to hear directly. William has always been rotten, but we lacked a decisive move to exclude him from the group. Letting him float around led to this mess. It's not your fault, Richard. My parents were involved in this too. James and I both had terrible parents. If only we had adopted James into our family earlier. Nancy muttered. Then Richard looked up. That's right, that's a good idea. Call the lawyer. Richard. I don't want those kids to end up like James. Richard said this and made me a proposal. Eventually, James's body, after the autopsy, was brought to Richard's house. For a private funeral and a memorial service within the group. I attended with the kids, as the representative of the bereaved family. Behind us, my parents sat shamelessly as James's in-laws. Colleagues from the company, all puzzled and saddened by James's sudden loss, were in attendance. He was truly an excellent employee. We were looking forward to his future in the group. Thank you. James would be honored to hear that. <laughs>
I mechanically repeated these greetings. Friends who joined the company at the same time as James were. How could this happen? Crying over the sudden loss. Everyone who had personal ties with James was genuinely good. But their parents. After the memorial service, Richard gathered the family, my parents, and the executives at his house. The large garden and halls of Richard's house were crowded with people. Then, someone came running in. Robert! He must have just arrived. Robert came running in, clutching a bag. Sorry I'm late, Susan, Linda. There were a lot of complications on my end. But it's good that the memorial service and the meeting were scheduled for today. It worked out. Robert had a sly smile. I'll return this to you. Robert took out a set of documents and a USB drive from his bag. Is it all settled? It was from the locker indicated by the key we received earlier. After leaving in Susan's car, we met up with Robert, who made copies of the documents and the drive. You've given the copies to our lawyer, right? Yes. That's good. We really needed the originals here. I nodded vigorously. At the meeting that started, Richard spoke in front of everyone about the incident, expressing his regrets over losing James, the successor. Then, when he paused, Richard continued. It's a real shame. And I think there's one thing I was wrong about. Richard called me and my two kids forward. The kids, understandably, looked frightened and almost tearful amidst the row of adults. I told them. It's okay. And supported them from behind. Here, I want to appoint the next successors. My new children, Daniel and Mary. They are James's children, but I have adopted them. The children? The crowd murmured. Many might be surprised. But I believe this tragedy occurred because I left James as just a nephew. Right? At Richard's words, all eyes turned to my in-laws. Richard, what are you saying? Should I say it here? Yes, go ahead. James took his own life, right? A suicide note was found. Probably couldn't handle the expectations. Really? You still have more to say. Yes. And these children as Richard's adoptees? Putting unnecessary pressure on them again? Well, they are William's grandchildren, so maybe they won't feel that much pressure. Ugh. William's face twisted. Actually, James didn't take his own life. Richard declared firmly. The crowd stirred. What are you saying? The note was found in the dashboard. No media outlet reported that it was found in the dashboard. That's when Robert spoke up. May I? He asked Richard for permission to speak. Please, go ahead. Meanwhile, William was visibly struggling. But if it was found in the car, then... That's just it, we haven't leaked anything to the media. Or perhaps, William, you weren't really interested in my affairs. Saying this, Robert pulled out a police badge from his suit pocket. Yes, Robert was a detective in the state police where we lived. Ugh. William choked on his words. Did he really not realize? I was genuinely astonished. Indeed, Susan had said. We haven't been in touch since he got the job. So I have heard about it before. Even when they got married, they only reported so. But shouldn't one at least be aware of the other's profession? That's just the kind of person he is. Susan's whisper was quietly heard. I could only provide crucial evidence for the investigation, being an insider. Then Robert explained. The police had been thoroughly investigating the car retrieved from the cliff since the beginning. They soon realized that the brakes had been tampered with which happened to be on the day James sent a letter through a scheduled delivery. That day, James first went to place something in a locker at the station. Then, he went to a post office inside the station to send a letter to Linda. It took him some time. It was then that someone tampered with the brake fluid system. But that alone wasn't enough to cause immediate trouble. After that, James drove towards Richard's house.
But on the way to here, there are several winding roads, right? Whispers began among the people around. Indeed. Many voices agreed. That's where a road rage incident happened, intentionally. And this road isn't always wide. Indeed, a local quirk is that despite being a frequently used road, it's surprisingly narrow in places. In such a situation, forced to precisely apply the brakes due to a road rage, I'm sure James soon realized the brakes were failing, but it was too late. So, that's what happened? Richard asked gravely. His words were vague, but the meaning was clear to all. Yes. And the police have identified the road rage driver from James's dash cam and have already apprehended him. Robert said, smiling wryly at my in-laws. But what does that have to do with us? The road rage participant was just a hired hand. The direct employer is still unknown. However, William, you and your wife are facing separate charges. Separate charges? Yes. For the embezzlement you've been committing for years. James had been secretly investigating this matter. This is the evidence. Suddenly, multiple projectors operated from somewhere lit up every wall with various documents. We will now arrest you for this embezzlement. Then, the back door opened, and police officers entered. And one more thing. Robert glanced at me, then turned to another direction. You there. What, us? My parents hesitated. You're being arrested for damaging Linda's car. But, that's just a family matter. Mom protested. I turned to her, asking sharply. A parent who breaks a car window with a bar? Indifferent to glass falling on their grandchildren's heads? I glared with all my might and said. You're not parents. My parents slumped back in their seats. Afterward. My in-laws, arrested for embezzlement, confessed to planning James's death during questioning, adding to their charges. My parents were also charged with aiding in their plan, in addition to property damage. The case was first leaked to local media, then reported by regional newspapers and local news. But it didn't end there. Given the sensational nature of the crime and the involvement of biological parents, it became fodder for national news and tabloid TV. And in this day and age, that was not enough. This was the digital age, they were branded indelibly. Even if they were released, what could they possibly do? But that's not my concern anymore. Since then, we've been living at Richard's house. His wife adores our two new children. Nancy, who always wanted but couldn't have children, is perhaps overindulging them a bit. But for now, that's okay. The kids, having just lost their dad, had to switch schools. I feel guilty for involving them in adult conflicts but I believe this is the safest option. 
As for Richard, I must stay healthy at least until the kids are grown. He's diligently working on his fitness. Everyone, tea is ready. I spend my days in this house taking care of the kids and keeping these two company. I'm not sure how much I can contribute to them, but for the kids' sake, I'll keep doing my best.